So I guess we can start. Yeah. So, uh, I invited Adam tonight to kind of present his uh, his um, his practice and uh, to show some of his works, and maybe after we can have a chance to speak and to exchange ideas and opinions about what you do. Um, I don't know. So the floor is yours. You can you can go. Ahead. Yeah. Well, th thanks. Um, thanks, Alexei. Yeah. Um, if I um, start speaking in a way that is too fast or not very clear, tell me and I'll try and speak more clearly. So my name's Adam Walker. I'm, um, I'm an artist. I'm based in London and um, yeah, I'm, uh, what else? I'm, I'm, I'm doing a practice-led PhD at the Royal College of Art now. Um, so what I'll do quickly here now is I, well, not too quickly, hopefully, hopefully the right length of time, not too, not too swift, but also not boringly long. I will present um, some of my work. I'm not, I mean, everything that I show is from the last couple of years. And um, I'll also show some of a exhibition that I recently curated that shows um, some other work that I think relates to some of the ideas that my work is trying to explore. And at the end, um, a brand new video piece that I've made in collaboration with an artist called Vicky Thornton, who some of you know, who um, we've just finished this work, so I'll show that at the end. And then, yeah, like Alexi said, we'll have time for questions and things. So um, we've got no Wi-Fi here, but I'm purposefully choosing to show most of my work using the local files of my website that I have on my laptop. And that's um, because, as you'll see, the sort of digital space is it's quite important to what I'm trying to do with a lot of these pieces that I'm going to be talking about. And the works that I show, they're all quite fluid, shifting constellations of fragments. That the, the, the boundary of sort of what is the artwork, what is research, what is, like, is quite fluid. So, so I, I use the, um, the website page as, as a sort of space that can hold that in a way that doesn't overly define what the artwork is. But it's also important, I, I want to say, to, that I'm, I'm not a digital artist. I mean, I work a lot in digital spaces, but my focus is on um, conceptual um, power structures um, in, in text and code, um, politics and labour, um, and the digital. And, and the work that I'll show hopefully seeks to engage in, in how the digital is um, affecting those different spheres um, and, and um, operating in accelerating feedback loops to affect current ideologies of power and effect on us as humans. So this first work that I, I just want to show is um, it's called The Return Beyond Which There Is No Point. I'll just turn that down a bit for the moment. Um, so this is a work that was produced here um, a couple of, well, last year. Um, but it began um, when I was on um, the SWAP British Council residency, which has been running for a few years and brings British artists here to Ukraine and Ukrainian artists and curators to Britain and um, then produces an exhibition each year here in Ukraine. So this image is from Yermolov Center in Kharkiv. I think it's important to say though, I don't make work that's about Ukraine. I, um, I came here because I saw the opportunity, I applied, I was accepted, and it was an incredibly useful, helpful, eye-opening experience which um, provided a different perspective on some of these, these issues around, around labour, around um, ideologies and around um, technology that I was looking at. But obviously 
there are affinities and, and there, there are strong affinities to some of those questions here that are very relevant in recent history and in, 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 in where Kiev sits in global economic systems and things. But um, it was it, it sort of, it's, there, was a, there was an affinity, but it was also quite a chance encounter. So um, this work consists of a fluid set of elements. Um, there's a film, um, which I'll show some of in a minute. There's a text, which was sort of the starting point. And this, I mean, this phrase, the return beyond which there is no point, which is the title of the work, is a inversion of a, a common phrase in English, um, beyond the point of no return, which is what people, it's a sort of, it's an idiom that is used to mean, um, you know, you've committed so much that there's no going back and you're fully in now. Um, but this inversion of it purposefully becomes something that is quite hard to pin down what it means if, if anything. And interpretations of what it means can be, can be taken in, in, in different directions. So are we talking about a sort of a victorious return, a, a reluctant turning back? Um, is this this um, this point that we're moving that there's a suggestion of moving beyond? Is, is, is are we entering into a position of nihilism where there's no point, or um, is it a, a culmination of some kind of teleological journey? So th the phrase is, is purposefully very ambiguous and um, paradoxical. Um, I was. In, in my practice at the time, thinking about questions of um, nationalism, fascism, um, identity narratives, and, and sort of global labor and, and, and te technological systems that I've already mentioned. And, and I'd had some interesting conf um, um, conversations with people here, which led to this. So the text was a sort of reflection on some of these issues. And I produced I worked with a local embroidery firm to produce a flag, which you see there. And the flag, um, the, the, the production of the flag itself was a, um, a, 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 um, a negotiation of possibilities and impossibilities. There were all of these, I had a f finite budget, um, which went a lot further here than it would have done in London but nevertheless there were these um there was this back and forth email exchange where these files were were sent back and forth of what was possible or impossible um and and te te technically as well because the, 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 the it's, an, it's the, the, these um these massively exaggerated cross stitch patterns which um were something that I noticed I haven't noticed them so much for this visit, but like when I was here six, uh, like two years ago, I noticed this um, red and black cross stitch pattern was something that was replicated on bus stops and shopping bags and everywhere. Um, the red and black was, um, I suppose, purposefully an echo of the colours of both the nationalist and the anarchist flag. And... Um, I just go to this. Um, okay. This was the um, this was the a performance that was done with the flag, but it was done on um, Defender of Ukraine Day, which. I'm sure most of you know more about Defender of Ukraine Day than me, but it's a day when um, marches take place and it's um, a day, as I understand, that's quite associated with nationalist ideas. And um, I suppose it's, it's, you know, it's ideas that are presented as something quite direct and, um, and um, binary. And what some of what this work is trying to do, uh, you can judge for yourselves whether or not you think it successfully does, but is to um, is to address 
the complexity of the world and to, and to reflect the fact that these binaries in things, for example, such as certain nationalist discourses, contemporary political situations in various places around the world, over flatten and oversimplify complex positions and situations. So this flag was, um, was um, taken from a building that some of you may know, which is Sashenko 33 Art Studios, which was the institution where I was being hosted. And um, I carried it along the, through the nearby streets and um, we went, there were about six or seven people following me. We went on this journey. This is all on my website, so if anyone wants to see these, these works in full, that's possible. Um, um, we ended up going through the forest, and the journey looped back around to Sashenke. where um, we ra I raised the flag on the roof of the building. Back in London, I then um, was thinking how to display this for um, the exhibition at Yermilov Center in Kharkiv that was a few months later. And um, it ended up being um, somewhat like this. I decided actually not to show the film in the end. Um, this soundscape that is playing is um, a work, uh, it's a sound work that I made in collaboration with a music producer friend of mine back in London in response to the thing, in response to the thinking around um, this sort of, this sort of turning back and this edging up to things and turning back and looping around and, and sort of what is the point at which it's important to commit to something. And so the work was um, displayed as this um, wall text that was, um, I don't know, five metres high, four metres high, which is the, the same text as was written before. Uh, the flag, this, the soundscape was playing in this space. And um, this single photo from the tram stop where these three men, one of them is um, bleeding from his head and um, I don't know what's happened but quite possibly they've been caught up in some kind of fight or something. Oh and, and yeah that's important, the flag itself was uh, taken and carried by gallery invigilators every day and they could do whatever they wished with it. 
take it out of the gallery if they wanted. I think they did sometimes. When I was here, um, I, uh, we also did another work, I'm not going to talk about this, but we did a work called Tombola. It was a, very, it was a really productive residency in terms of generating work. This was, a, um, this was the first collaboration that I did with Vicky Thornton, who um, the, the, the video that I'll show at the end is the most recent one from. Um, but I'm going to talk about this briefly. This is a work called, quite literally, Six Weeks in Kiev. But while I was here, I, I kept this table of my uh, Uber journeys. And I, I, I don't, you know, I, I sort of have ethical issues with Uber. And I, um, I don't use it very much in London at all because it's um, incredibly expensive for someone who's, I mean, it's not as cheaper than other, other taxis, but it's very expensive for an artist to be getting a taxi around. So, but, you know, because of the, um, the um, global economic system, for some reason, it becomes quite affordable for me here. And Soshenko, for those who don't know, is right on the edge of Kiev and takes a long time by tram to get to. So I was using Uber some of the time. So I kept this handwritten table um, which uh, keeps all the details that of, you know, this is the information that Uber, of course, is collecting on the drivers and, and my rating there at the, at the, in the last column fluctuating depending on how they rate me as a passenger. I took that and... Um, oops, not, not that one, sorry. I took that table and um, built, I, I sort of taught myself the basics of a, a visual programming language called Pure Data, which um, is a, a, a means of um, manipulate. I, I built a vocoder um, using this, um, this language, it'll, some of it will show in a minute, but it's a sort of visual means of coding using inputs and outputs and different links and effects to sound data. So, um, I, the, the, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm effectively reading out the table of Uber journey data that I'd collected. It's going through the microphone into my computer where this program that I've built is taking the data that the, the sound waves of my voice are being converted into um, numerical data, and that is then passing through this program, which is then triggers these outputs, um, um, different frequencies, different MIDI notes, um, delays, echoes, and things which are built into the program. The only input is my voice, which comes from this handwritten table of data. This is a work from last autumn. Um, the text here, I'm, I'm going to sort of paraphrase what it says here because um, the text itself is part of the work. It's not really a description of the work. Um, so I'll explain. So sequestered 
2018, curated by MIT, which is the Turkish Nas um, National Intelligence Agency. This artwork was created while on a residency in a city called Adana, which is in southern Turkey, quite close to the Syrian border. And physically, the work consists of 34 A4 pages of my handwriting and 24 A4 pages of type text, which are exactly copied from my handwriting by a typist called Yasser. And he's one of several typists who sit with um, like manual typewriters on the pavement opposite the main courthouse in, um, in this city. As well as um, writing up official documents for people who have business in the courthouse often, they, they've sort of acquired quite a lot of, um, of knowledge of the systems and the bureaucracies there. So they have become um, unofficial advisors on bureaucratic and legal processes. So the three texts, each of which are both handwritten and typed, are word-for-word -word transcriptions of um, three Turkish Wik Wikipedia articles. I don't speak Turkish, so there's probably some mistakes in there. But um, I, um, yeah, I spent several days writing out the entirety of these Turkish Wikipedia articles. Um, Yasser's typing, his involvement took place, it's quite important to say, his involvement in the work took place after a lot of time and um, conversation between us and he, he, um, he wanted to be involved and we'd spoken about what we were doing quite a lot and um, I was happy that he knew the risks and wanted to be involved. So the first of the three texts was a text called Inchilik Hava Usu. Um, if anyone speaks Turkish, I don't know, um, my pronunciation is probably terribly wrong, but the, the, so Inchilik, so it's Inchilik Air Base, and it's um, a shared Turkish and American military air base, which is 15 minutes outside Adana. And um, it's been operational since the 1950s, and it was a, a sort of key part of US Cold War infrastructure. It had nuclear missiles based there and, and all sorts of things. And in, in more recent years, it's been a, a, a sort of key infrastructural node in Western military intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, and now Syria. I believe it's where s some of the bombing flights that were going to Syria took off from. Uh, so we went to see it, and it was, um, you know, you, huge fence, security. You're in Turkey on one side, the other side looks like a sort of complete stereotypical American suburbia. And um, yeah, Turkish intelligence agent stopped us and asked us what we were doing. The second of the three texts is uh, called Türkiye'de Censor, which is um, the Turkish for censorship in Turkey. And this text traces the history of censorship in Turkey from the Ottoman period through to the present and places an emphasis on current internet blocking under the Erdogan regime. And at the time of making the art of, of transcribing these texts, Wikipedia in both English and Turkish was inaccessible in Turkey. But I discovered from a, another artist there that um, if you simply, you could like search for a topic, you'd see the link to the Wikipedia page, you click on it, it wouldn't load, but in the address bar if you added a zero in before the W of Wikipedia, it, you went to a, a mirror site which some Turkish activists had set up which, which made available this copy of Wikipedia. So it was from there that I, um, I transcribed the texts. And the, the final text is Surai ik Savasinde Multichile, which is Refugees of the Syrian Civil War. And um, Turkey, this, this, as, this, as this Wikipedia page explains, Turkey holds more refugees displaced outside of Syria than any other country from the Syrian Civil War. And following the sort of media storm around um, people dying trying to cross to Europe, um, the, the, the EU now pays Turkey billion, I don't know how many, several billion dollars every year to keep Turkish, uh, sorry, to keep Syrian refugees in Turkey rather than allowing them to, to pass through. And 
there's a large Syrian refugee community in Adana and they face numerous bureaucratic hurdles lots of, uh, and um, often don't have access to computers and are frequent visitors to typists like Yasser. So um, I came to displaying the work. We're having an exhibition in um, the Archaeological Museum in Adana and um, Turkish intelligence agents came as we were installing and insisted that the texts on Inchilik Air Base and ironically on censorship in Turkey, ironically but perhaps not surprising, couldn't be displayed. So the, the work became um, much reduced, rather than three boards it was one, and solely the, uh, the texts. So there's my handwritten part and then the typed part of um, refugees of the Syrian civil war. So I, I've, I've now displayed the work a couple of times in, in London and um, in Lisbon since then, but I display it as curated by um, the Turkish intelligence services and credit them for that. Um, I'm now going to show a work called um, uh, Our Skins Are Porous 2. So this is somewhat different in that rather than being a um, rather than being a solely my own work, this is a this is a, um, a sort of a curatorial project slash artwork which I was asked to do by a um, an online platform platform an online um, sort of gallery space called Skelf who. Um, they, they, they work, they, they only have an online presence and, and, and they, they work with artists and curators who are looking to, um, to explore the digital space as a space in and of itself, not as a sort of uh, crappy attempt to document stuff that would be better experienced in a different, in a different encounter. So um, this is, I mean, we don't, like I said, we don't have Wi-Fi here, so I've, this is this is this exists as a as a web page. You can anyone can go to this. It's still up. But um, uh, this so this is just a screen recording of me playing um, playing around, exploring it, and clicking on some of the things. So um, what the work the show seeks to do is um, focus on 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 the on the relationship between um, sort of increasingly ephemeral and, demater and dematerialized but omnipresent structures of, of power, of technology and of capital and, and sort of then reflect back onto that the overlooked material labor and, and sort of bodily violence and exploitation that often if not always underpins those systems and um, I mean, I use, when I'm talking about this sort of, um, this thing that's sort of so big and, and difficult to sort of get a handle on, man, and it's sort of universal, um, but disparate, I, I use the term technosphere, um, which is um, what Hauster, Kultur and De Welt in, um, in, um, in Berlin did a project, lots of, um, lots of articles using this term. So the the, um, the scrolling band of text has um, has um, works Emperor, set I within trust it. You are well and hope your trip off the island was fruitful. I am really excited that you are willing to participate in my project. Firstly, I would like to ask a few questions to inform my research, and allow me to decide on how best to carry out my ideas. I will then write up a clear proposal of what I am thinking of and send it over to you. So this is a work by an, an artist who I invited to be part of it called Naomi Ellis. She's based in London as well. And um, it's, um, the image is of um, uh, Botany Bay, in, um, which is a sort of his historical site where um, the, the is it Botany? No, sorry, not Botany Bay. Bounty Bay, which is a historical site on this small island in the Pacific, where um, a, a British ship um, mutinied 
and they went there and so, tried to start their own society away from um, the rules of the British Empire and um, and um, and uh, yeah so this the ship sank in the bay and this community lives there and they're all they're sort of were, were until recently at least all descendants of this mutinying community and Naomi's project was um, to um, in, well, she, she sort of engaged in this dialogue with um, the tourist administrator of the island um, and the dialogue as it plays out is quite interesting talking about um, the the sheer expense of um, of sort of internet connectivity there and, and she's and she's trying to do this sort of online back and forth of like sending images and things but it, bec it becomes incredibly expensive to, to send the images and she, and 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 um, and uh, what's her name, Martha, the woman in, on the island, is also talking about the, um, the laboriousness of, of labour and how everyone has to help in the field to produce food for the community. This is a work, it's a sort of ongoing project by an artist called, um, ah, I've forgotten his name, Tim, Tim someone, I'll remember. But it's, um, it is, um, it's called Noisy Admin Machine and he's, um, he, he spent time in, um, in sort of co-working spaces and cafes where freelancers at their laptop were um, going to work and he recorded the sort of bodily sounds that they made, their sighs and grunts of frustration and, and, and then he, his background is in sound and he somehow sort of um, mapped these, spliced up these sounds and connected them onto his keyboard. So now as he, as he works on his laptop, these sounds are produced. This next work is um, by a Ukrainian artist called um, Olga Fedoreva. It's called Three Billboards. So the different works can be open at the same time. And this is also a, um, a Ukrainian artist, Bogdan Moroz. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was important to me to. I spent a lot of time uh, um, a couple of years ago here on, 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 on the residency and, and, and um, coming back again. It, um, it felt important to me to maintain those connections and maintain those relationships and, um, and involve people in this. Uh, you know, I, I knew the work and the work, I, I wanted it any, in, in any way. But in, in terms of the residency, um, I think you know, residencies are sort of things that can be questioned in many ways, I think. And some of the questions of um, capital and inequality and privilege, complicity that I'm trying to look at in my broader practice are sort of all occurring in microcosm within the residency site as well. So um, it was a purposeful thing to bring artists work from here into this exhibition, which would have been quite easy to do with just um, UK based artists, but I didn't want to do that. Um, this is uh, a work by um, a guy who's, um, who's changed his name to name surname and, and um, this, um, 
this text uh, records a conversation he had with his bank where he tried to explain why he'd changed his name to name surname and his signature spells out signature um, as his sort of um, his uh, critique of um, contemporary um, systems of data collection and bureaucracy and 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 and, um, and then at the end he does um, successfully manage to get his uh, bank card in the name oh, of well you can see it there in the name of Mr. Name Surname. The text is, um, it continually cycles um, moments of rupture, of bleeding, of seeping amidst the everyday banality of sweat, 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 dripping, running in rivulets down a hunchback and lubricating the machine. Our skins are porous too. Holding us in, a containing vessel within which we move in something we only encounter through it, epidemically veiled, except when we don't or won't, when we spill out across fragments of co-recollected nothingness, maybe everything, a shared encounter, syringe me gently, stretched out across different bodies of different thought and differing relationship, cyborg bodies reaching out and colliding with the screen, a moment of connection similarly taught and sensual to touch, a caress, no faster. What else? Uh, this is a yeah. Um, this is a work where um, this this is a sort of video that came out of a project where um, the artist uh, she's called Alessandra Farini. She worked with um, co communities of migrants in uh, a city in Italy. Oh, sorry, in a city in Italy where. Um, um, uh, they, 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 they sort of a sh they, um, refugees essentially had set up a, a shanty town and were doing this informal labour, working in um, working in um, sort of agriculture, picking fruit and things. Um, and um, th this radio station be became a sort of a lifeline for them, a way of forming community. And, and Alessandra was involved in um, helping set this up, and then. What the uh, sorry, I'm tr yeah, it's hard sort of doing this. Yeah, um, so it feels it feels like I should be able to navigate the website, but it's a video. So, um, um, what she uh, and then the the video um, the video um, I'm trying to open another work here, but um, technology doesn't always work. That's one of the things you have to work with, of course. And, and for some reason, it wasn't loading. But um, the video goes on to. Um, sort of find these, she's sort of navigating around the space where this work is being undertaken um, on Google Maps and particularly finding the sort of boundaries and um, divisions within the landscape. I think I'll show a little bit, perhaps. Maybe this next bit. Yeah. Um, what else is there? Uh, oh yeah, and this is um, this is a work by um, Elliot Jones. He's an old friend of mine. I used to share a studio with him actually. But um, it's called Church of Bitcoin. from all regulation, free, from control. Welcome me into Bitcoin space. Call me by number, individual, but unified, connected with all users. I acknowledge one Bitcoin space in blockchain through the sacrifice of physical money to make my true value grow. I believe in Satoshi Nakamoto author of the white paper and the central sacrament of interpersonal transaction through blockchain with blockchain and in blockchain in the unity of bitcoin space through the holy sacrament of interpersonal transaction 
Uh, so um, the um, this um, he's essentially invented this cult, which um, worships Bitcoin, and, and the, the the sound he sort of um, worked with a choir to produce this score, singing out the the actual um, blockchain code, and then this was a, this is a sort of downloadable PDF of how you can uh, join um, Church of Bitcoin. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it didn't load when I was doing it the first time. It did the next time. This is the last work that was included. This is a work called Mirage. Oh, it opens like this as a new page. But it's, um, it's a series of photographs which docu document in the present spaces in Israel which had been consecrated as um, spaces that would be used as, as uh, graves in the Six Day War. And um, that no, no one no, is, is, they're not really very known about. They, they sort of, um, a lot of them have become redeveloped, but um, these spaces were sort of sanctified in preparation for mass casualties that were predicted, but um, didn't occur. And um, the title Mirage is also a reference to Mirage being um, one of the principal um, military aircraft that Israel was using in the Six Day War. The artist is Israeli. Where are we? Okay, so um, that's enough of the older stuff. So I'm now going to show a work called Undertitled, which is. Um, a collaboration between myself and Vicky Thornton. Um, we met on the SWAT residency here. We were both living at Isolatia. She was actually in residence with Isolatia, whereas I was just living there, but technically in residence with Sashenko. And um, I'm not going to say too much about it, but um, other than it's a, uh, it's a three, it's, it, it's actually, um, it's, it's very new. We've not really shown it anyway yet, but it's, um, it's three channels, so um, this is a sort of composite of the three together. So they will be quite small, but this is quite a small room, so hopefully that will work fine. And um, it's got Ukrainian subtitles, but they'll be quite small. But I think everyone here has fairly good English, I hope, because I've just been speaking a lot. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, the, the point is, um, even if this were being shown in in an English-speaking context, it would have English subtitles there as sort of part of it. The show starts in five, four, three, two, one minute. And now, on with the show. Behind for us to find. 
After a long time, the tree sap would get hard and become fossilized, just like a dinosaur bone, preserving the mosquito inside. And bingo. Yes. 
it was uh, there were real real conversations of, of people yes they were recorded and yeah now, now we we have times that we are recorded we are our faces are recorded our voices are recorded unfortunately maybe you don't like it or like it but if we use technology we just can choose to use technology or not yeah and also we can give permission but we know that it is so advanced now that that it is difficult not to be recorded somewhere yes uh, our task was uh, to listen to the recording it was recorded it was surreal uh, conversation and uh, i heard uh, this re uh, recording and uh, uh, the text appeared on the screen and just i needed to correct this um this text if it was um Grammatically correct. It was uh, punctuality was correct. Yes, and it, it was my task. And very often it was quite um, uh, quite good. In general, I needed to correct, for example, some spelling or some punctuation. But in general, the sentence um, uh, have had sense. This is the most the most important. That technology is, um, I think, it's quite good at the moment. And it was, you know, the the data, the, the recording was collected from real conversation. It was sent to the to the center of the computer, and later on we did just the rest. Yes. I love machines. I still do. to go into the office of course but it was normal it was normal work yeah, like office work and we checked how technology recognizes uh, is it correctly yeah, how technology recognizes in the how it changes into the text yeah, it was just a voice a human voice and and the, the text the yes, written text and then another, uh, another um, sentence for example another you know, phrase and you correct it and it, it was all the time, yeah, for example, I don't know, uh, it was 500s or, you know, 700s, uh, for example, per day, yeah, it depends, yes, but every time it was the same, because you just hear, for example, the one sentence that was recorded, and you just see it on the computer and just correct it. Whether it's in the way you type, whether it's in the way you think, whether it's in the way you communicate, there's, you know, there's to be choose. We think of massively similar, there's enough subtlety in the difference. Our organization is fully distributed, there's no office. We are doing it independently, but at the same time, we could make friends as well, uh, and we could work also to discuss some, some things, yes, how to, I don't know, to solve this or that, yes, when in, in some, I don't know, some situation that we were not sure. In other words, that. Um, the power of any system is going to reside in who owns the data of that system. For an individual, there's no cost to handing over really effectively the keys to your house because it's not a house. My data is it's not a house. It's you know, oh, the worth of it is probably like five hot dogs over the course of the year. But when you have a billion people and all giving away their five hot dogs to one source, then suddenly you have uh, one organisation hoovering up all of these tiny sub-industries and creating this 
a base. Maybe it is not the language, it is the content. Yes, it depends on, on the, you know, what kind of person you are. Because it doesn't matter if you think about you know, good or bad things in, in, in any language, in English or in French or in German, it doesn't matter. It means what do you think? What do you think about? What is your way of thinking? What, what is your you know, attitude to other people? And I think this, is, this, may, this makes us human. So um, that is that is me. So um, yeah, I think I think I've spoken enough, really. So um, let's put something up 
to look at, but it, I guess, I don't know, what do you normally do, Alexa? Should we, is it like just opening it up to questions or um, just a discussion or? Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can show my work if people want that, but I think it maybe would be more interesting to. Yeah, yeah I think it's time for questions and answers yeah. from the audience. I can start with a very simple question. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, your work has a um, close relation with language. Uh, so can you explain a little bit on the role of language, why you use it, and, and how and how you approach the language in your work? Because almost every piece that you show mm -hmm. uh, features language in, 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 some, in some sense. Uh, yeah, well, I think um, I'm... I, I sort of I didn't realize until a couple of years ago that language was the dominant the dominant thing that sort of linked my practice and and, um, and connected things together that sometimes became that felt quite disparate. But I think um, there's a essay by Roland Bart called "From Work to Text" from 1970 something, where he um, he talks about um, shifting the, um, the like langu language is a sort of a, a, a um, it's a while since I've read it but this is what made me think it's, um, it, it's shifting the emphasis in the artwork from from away from um, the sensorial or the or the or the um, the um, the percept or the sort of um, aesthetic in a, in, in a sort of um, in a fixed static sense to instead being this um forming this this uh, not narrative but this sort of f fragment of things that connect together in 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 the in the contingent encounter of each viewer and i think for me that's the importance of language in and and and, and, and text i suppose and, and text um text being something that um, isn't just the, the 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 actual bits of text. Like I, I think of like all of the different elements as big bits of text that get put together in different ways. Of course, um, I, I, you know, and, and language then feeds into um, you know the English language is an interesting thing. The, Engl the, the English language is a sort of um, where that sits in, in you know in terms of colonialism and, and post-colonialism and, and those questions. In terms of data, in terms of information, in terms of algorithm, the way our, our, our the way our world is increasingly being constructed through these language systems. So, yeah, those are the the reasons that I sort of choose to work with language and the things that I like to explore in language. But uh, you never try to like write poems or like uh, fictional texts, uh, just like. Um, just like I, I mean, I, I do, I do write, um, and I try to write in, in ways that similarly play with language. Um, there are other things I could could have shown you that were, I suppose, more of a more of a, a text rather than an artwork. But um, yeah, I, I mean, I think moving. Out of this, out of the formal structures of language, enables these um, enables things to happen and non-linear connections and, and and sort of ways of thinking outside of the sort of limitations of those structures that I, that I find interesting. If you, when you move out of just the text, in a in a formal sense. Um, I have a understanding question. You said you were transcribing. Maybe I don't understand. Transcribing the Wikipedia site, that means you, cop you let them translate in English and you copied it out? Or I didn't no, I was, I, was, I was writing them in Turkish. So I, I had the Turkish in sequestered. I had the Turkish, um, if I actually, yeah, I had the, um, the, uh, the Turkish um, Wikipedia site open and I sat and um, Wrote it out okay. by hand. And then you let it translate? No, it was never translated. 
it remained in Turkish and um, then was typed out by this, by guy. this guy. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So, but did you know what, uh, what it said? Or? Um, I can't, I, well, I mean, I, I can't remember at what point, but yeah, I did look at the English language versions of the pages, which are different, but have yeah. some of the same information. And, it, you know, in, in the process of doing it, I, um, I started to, because I spent like several days writing out Turkish, and I, I guess because I understand and I'm very familiar with the, um, the, the form of a Wikipedia page, I, I gradually start to learn some words and some like grammatical things that went together and stuff. Um, That's a stupid question. You could have just printed it out also, no? Oh, I, I could have done, but the the act of the 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 the, the, the act of doing that physical work was was important to me. It's also interesting that you used Wikipedia and not other uh, online resources mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we probably all know that Wikipedia is like open source, uh, crowd source uh, sort of encyclopedia, but there is a lot of battles mm -hmm. in certain articles on, mm -hmm. on the viewpoints and you know this knowledge is which we take as granted as for granted this knowledge is very subjective and sometimes it's also controlled mm -hmm. by some forces i read a lot about russian wikipedia and uh, there was like groups of people controlling this or that part of, of it of, let's say this group of people controls humanitarian and historical topics mm -hmm. and that group of people controls like only mm -hmm. scientific topics and they really really choose what to include and what to exclude so the power structures inside wikipedia are really evident mm -hmm. and uh, most of the people just read it as is as the plain truth uh, yeah source of truth yeah no exactly yeah, yeah please don't be shy Um, well, when it's, when we, when we, if, when, hopefully when we properly install it, it will be a sort of, um, it won't be th flat as three, it'll be a space that you step into, so you're in the middle of it. And um, I suppose it particularly in what the male voice David talks about, there is this, um, this, uh, for me, uh, sense of um, sense of a sort of um, oh, where's that gun? I don't know. Anyway, he's um, a sense of a, um, a sense of a uh, a religious belief in the sort of um, utopian potential future of of um, this. Um, well, of technology in general, but in particular, this um, this sort of blockchain type thing that he is building, and um, I mean, obviously, the the three the three thing connects back to um, altarpieces and sort of Christian iconography. And that project where you exchanged emails with. Um Somebody from this island, from the bounty. Yes, this that wasn't that wasn't me. That was um, a work within the um, the the. So I I I sort of curated the exhibition and designed the um, okay. designed the space. But the work um, was um, by where is it? Let's so yeah. So uh, it was so yeah. I, so I designed and sort of developed this text and thought about and, and brought the works in and, and, and but the work yeah um, the tourist ad administrator of um, Bitcan uh, of um, Pitcairn Island yeah I, it's a while since I've watched it properly so I can't remember the full details of it but um, 
so the, the imagery is um, her hands molding this clay and as she does it, it, um, it creates these shadows and, and breakages and, and, and ripples and ruptures within the static image that's of Bounty Bay that's being projected onto it. And the text is this um, recording of this email exchange where... Um, but that yeah. island now belongs to its official part of Great Britain. I believe it is part of the one of these tiny islands that there are still a few of around the world that are still British overseas territories. Yeah, that's my understanding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, are increasingly used as sort of tax havens to hold offshore capital or sell um, I don't know if you've heard this story, but that small island, uh, not particularly this one, but that area, uh, intended to be used by blockchain millionaires uh, in the um, United States to actually organize floating cities. Right. Uh, wow. And to be completely autonomous. Yeah. Uh, and they want to place those like the cities uh, on water close mm -hmm. to those Caribbean uh, mm. islands. Yeah, there's, there's all these, this is uh, these sort of, um, this sort of idea that uh, this sort of freedom in a sort of sense of a complete absence of any kind of, just a sort of being outside of anything and like freedom as some natural state and if we can escape the state or, or um, society or whatever, if we're like rich and privileged enough for the, like uh, with our own intelligence or whatever like we might believe about ourselves, then we can sort of find these new utopias as this like persistent thing and yes, there's this sort of um, history of um, seasteading when like people built these, these sort of forts off the coast outside of territorial waters to live on and it's very connected in to um, libertarian movement in the in the US and that's a huge as you probably know it's a huge um, sort of um, a popular discourse in, in Silicon Valley so you've got people like um, Elon Musk and, um, and people sort of buying these huge tracts of land in like Alaska or New Zealand and building these like refuges where they will go and live out um, their remaining life and their children will when the world gets destroyed in some kind of climactic apocalypse. They also invest a lot of money in Haiti, uh, this uh, country which suffered a lot from uh, these earthquakes and mm -hmm. uh, also natural disasters. Mm -hmm. money and they want to evade taxes basically mm -hmm. their goal is to evade taxes yeah because in us they have to pay a lot of yeah. money tax and they want to set up something ideally in the, in neutral water mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't belong to any country and there is no law which governs those water regions mm -hmm. Ab absolutely like completely no law mm -hmm. they can basically be in, a pa in paradise there but yeah. they, want, they want to really establish like a floating Floating cities mm -hmm. there, completely mm -hmm. like autonomous, powered by solar energy, blockchain economy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and somehow yeah. this project is related with these uh, Caribbean small island countries like Vanuatu, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Antigua, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was just reading. I was just um, just reading an article today actually about how. Um, St Kitts and Nevis, which is another tiny former British overseas territory, um, they started this project, which is now it's now common in um, Malta and, and places where anyone, if they invest enough money, can come and, and basically buy the nationality. So it's not even just a sort of offshoring of wealth, but it's an offshoring of like sort of our. Um, as subjecthood within the framework of, of, of states, which we still, to some extent, exist within, even if it's changing a lot. But and um, yeah, so that any if you're rich enough, you can sort of get any passport you want and travel and just be free to navigate the world in your first-class cabin and fly over everyone else. Is this uh, online web? Exhibitions. Is this format popular in uh, Great Britain? Um, because British Council apparently does this Museum Without Walls project. Uh, they yeah. Um, they is do it one exhibition a year, uh -huh. completely online? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know very much about that. I'd be interested to, to, to learn more. Um, but, um, is it popular in Britain? Yeah, I think there's, um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of artists who aren't, but there's for sure a, a lot of artists who are working with, um, digital spaces in different ways, like whether that be, um, projects working through um, different social media channels or or um, or um, all sort of um, yeah like web web sites like uh, like this kind of thing and and many other things I'm sure that I can't think so of yeah, yeah. Um, so this website did you is it sort of the exhibition or did you show this website in the frame of an exhibition no the website is the exhibition it has been it has been exhibited as an exhibition within another exhibition uh -huh. but that's not really its its purpose it, it is it is something to be to be encountered through the personal screen in the like pro probably alone kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah 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 i mean i didn't mention but in terms of that like we we did um we did sort of take it out of purely being this digital thing and we, we decided we wanted to sort of because this I guess there's this theme in lots of things that I do where it's sort of going there and then doubling back and like sort of um, and so we um, we um, we decided to do a physical invitation um, which has the text and was a, a sort of continuous Mobius band um, and there's also a podcast where I get interviewed about it which was uh, okay. Do you know that uh, the rezone.org, uh, uh, yeah. they have uh, software to archive yeah. all these online exhibitions? Because yeah. the problem about online exhibitions, we all know, mm -hmm. online websites come and go, right? So exactly. So Hosnik expires and yeah. nobody will see your exhibition again. Yeah. So rezone has invented some custom software, you submit your exhibition there, and they crawl it and they put it in the archive. Yeah, yeah, I've used it. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's yeah. Resonde. 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 Yeah. Yeah. You can they preserve it. You can also visit. Yes, yes. yes. They yeah. they uh, interested in these online digital exhibitions, mm -hmm. and you can submit your exhibition yeah. to them, and they will parse it with their software and put it in the archive. Yeah, yeah. No, they, it's a good site. They've got lots of. Um, interviews with interesting artists, people like um, Erica Scorti and Joey Holder and people who are working in, in, that, in that area and have been for longer than me. Um, and uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Oh, no, in the UK, yeah. Is it, um, is it popular? Well, it's, 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 you know, yes. I mean, I think a, a lot of the major, I mean, it's, it's obviously not it's by its nature it, it becomes a very tricky thing to to operate within a sort of commercial art sphere so it but um so it's but some of the the bigger um public sector galleries are trying to find interesting ways of of showing work that's operating like this in um in a in a way that works and i think for a general audience, I mean, for a sort of a, 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 a niche audience of like a mailing list of people who are interested, a, a digital site is, is is quite good. But in terms of sort of large footfall, if that's what a gallery wants, is sort of it's not going to generate what an exhibition in physical space does. So I mean, I'm thinking recently there was a big retrospective of of like 90s net art, but then also a, a big show of um, contemporary stuff working in the dig in the in the digital and online space at um, at the Whitechapel Gallery, which um, works quite well, but you know, there's, you know, there's, it's the it's the issue of like it sort of has some of the same issues as as um, as, as video or, or, or um, like a sort of a form of work that is being brought into the infrastructure of art, but is perhaps not a form of work that fits in its best way within that infrastructure. So it's something that's being navigated. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a current exhibition by um, 
Hito Shdale, um in London as well, at the Serpentine Gallery, where um, they've tried to sort of bridge it by, they have a very um, immersive sort of physical space, but then it has like these apps and things that you, you download to your phone and you sort of navigate the, um, the space through, through your phone or tablet as a sort of aug augmented interaction in the gallery. So it's exhibition going now or? Uh, I, I think so, I think it's still on, yeah. Okay, yeah. in Serpentine Yeah. Oh, nice. uh, questions? Comments? Regarding the work as text, I was uh, interested to know, um, no, uh, is, uh, do you have uh, what, uh, do you have any ideas how you, uh, when you work with the text, in what direction you're going to work or how, how, how it's going to develop? And also, when does imagery come and join the text or does, or does it all come all together or how you uh, actually organize the text then mm -hmm. visually mm -hmm. so that uh, it appears to the audience. How, how does that happen? Interesting. Yeah, I think, um, I think the, I mean, I suppose some of the, some of the works where I I, I work more solely me, don't have very much imagery and it becomes about the text very much. But if, if um, you know, thinking about the, the, the flag piece or the, or, um, or the, the uh, undertitle that I shared at the end there, I think they're, they're, they're in parallel. And well, in, no, in, I think it just depends. So the flag piece, it was very much the, the production and the imagery themselves were sort of in this back and forth interplay with the text and um, the, the compromises and, and sort of um, and um, contradictions in, in, the, in, the, in the visual elements and the, vis and the sort of economic conditions of the visual elements connected into the text and vice versa with them um, with under titles, I suppose it was a somewhat different thing, and there the text definitely came first. The, the, the starting point was these. We, we it's a different process because it's it's working with um, Vicky Thornton, who she has a. I mean, we work together, but we work. She works very differently to me, and when we collaborate, we work differently to how either of us would do individually. And she comes from much more of a filmmaking background than me, so. I suppose there's there's an element of sort of a script, and then the visual coming onto that in that work more. Um, the visual is it's all I mean, it it it's it tries to become another text. It's all um it's all um material pulled from YouTube and stuff and and um, and uh, and I suppose in in a in a sense or, or Google Maps or whatever. But it's trying to um, It's trying to create a different lens through which to hear the text. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking about technology, uh, there is now like the two movements, so to speak, technological optimists kind of uh, giving up their positions in favor of technological pessimists. Would you describe yourself in one of these two terms, or maybe with something else? Uh, what is your relation to technology? Because you use yeah. uh, digital um, and technology a lot. My relation to technology is not to be in either of those two camps. I mean, I'm not. I, I mean, I certainly, I'm not. I, I think you know. There's, there's the, all these. There's this. This sort of anti-technology nostalgic thing of like technology is all bad and we need to go back to some sort of, sort of trade unionist manufacturing and, 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 um, and sort of handicrafts and and I, I, I you know that is simply un, unviable in terms of like maintaining a, a good quality of life for the global population and also like this technology is happening and I think it, so I think I don't have a sort of positive um, 
I don't, I don't I'm, I'm not sort of a, a accelerationist. I, I'm not sort of advocating a sort of technology, 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 more, 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 more in, a, in, a, in, in the hope that sort of capitalism will eat itself and, and techno-capitalism will, will eat itself through that. I think, I think, too, I think the, the risks of people getting, of like vulnerable people getting hurt are too significant in that, to push for that. So my engagement with technology is, it is the world I live in and it is a world that is, it's the world that we all live in, it's a world that's rapidly changing and it's a world that it would be pointless for me to be outside of. So I'm in it and it's how can I maintain a criticality within that position of being within it? Which might not answer, might not have fully answered your question. Yeah, yeah, but yeah that, okay. That, that, that yeah. Does okay. Questions? More questions? <laughs> all right, all right. Let's call it a day maybe. Cool. And, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. No, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah.